morning. It's now time for the panel discussion. We got all your favorites here today. We're going to start things off with the shrink who in the fairy tale land that was got shrunk. We've got Raphael Sabarge. This next one is easy. This guy spins every scene into pure gold. Robert Carlyle. Oh, yeah. Take a seat, Leona Helmsley, because this next lady is playing the real queen of mean, Lana Perilla. Now, how about a hand for the guys who bring these great stories to life? We've got executive producer Steve Perlman. <laughs> series creator Adam Horowitz. And series creator Eddie Kitsis. We've got a pretty lady here with us today to teach us about the business of snow. Jennifer Goodwin. Anything I say next is just going to be drowned out by whoops and whistles. So uh, let's just say he's a real prince, Josh Dallas. And last but not least, yeah, she saved a few lives over on House as a doctor, but now she's got the fate of a whole main town in her hands. She's the bounty hunter that any sane man would want to be caught by. <laughs> Jennifer Morrison. How is everybody today? Good, how are you? That is, a, that is a great shirt you're wearing. Can you? I like that one. <laughs> This is my uh, Lost Find Flight 815 shirt. Oh, nice. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Nice. I haven't worn it since uh, that show wild. Walked Into the Light, but I thought it would be appropriate for today because it's all about the Easter eggs, right? Absolutely. Yeah. There are a few. A few. Um, but the episode we just watched, Dreamy, uh, what was in there? Just a little one, uh, candles that were sold were 42 candles, one okay. of our favorite numbers. <laughs> and I've, I've seen there's at least one website that's all devoted to keeping track of the lost references. Uh, for example, someone pointed out that when we saw the Queen's Vault of Hearts, it was nine rows by 12 columns, which adds up to 108. It's a lot of work to run a show. It's even more work to also run that website. <laughs> really busy. Are there, any, uh, are there any that you think might have slipped under the radar? Maybe people haven't caught on to yet? Uh, I think the Apollo bars were pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, the, we, we put them in so often, I can't even remember. And we apparently have really smart fans, because I think they've pretty much yeah. caught them all. And of course, you've had Alan Dale on the show. You had Emily DeRobin. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did, uh, did you have Josh Holloway in to read for uh, Rumpelstiltskin? Uh, we have not. Uh, we tried to get the smoke monster, but it was, <laughs> took another pilot. Uh, so. so we got the curse monster. Yeah. <laughs> What about non-lost Easter eggs? I know one of my readers uh, caught uh, the sorcerer's hat from uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice in one of the episodes. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, another one was the original dark one was named Zoso for Led Zeppelin fans who know Jimmy Page. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's little ones like in the pilot when Emma wishes on the blue star, mm. if you know Pinocchio, you know that that's how he wishes on the blue star and the blue fairy comes in. So there's little things in each episode that are also you know, uh, more fairy tale related. I want to run some numbers by you guys, but I think you're going to like these numbers. Uh, they're kind of like rating stuff. <clears throat> more than 20 drama series debuted this TV season, and Once Upon a Time stands as the top rated drama <laughs> premiere of this TV season. Once Upon a Time is the number one show with women 18 to 49 beating even. Uh, Two Broke Girls and New Girl, as far as new series. And uh, one thing I thought was interesting, it's also the number one show as far as family co-viewing, which means a lot of adults watch the show with their kids. 
Now, tonight you're airing episode 14. You said you're shooting 20 now and you're starting to write the finale as we speak. Mm -hmm. What's been the most challenging part about bringing this to life? Well, I think everything about it has been an incredible challenge. <laughs> and, uh, anytime you have a show that involves dwarves and fairies and wolves <coughs> and children actors, um, but you know, it's challenging writing and you know, thankfully we don't have to do it alone. Yeah. We have a great staff who is here tonight. You guys should stand, stand up. up. Had, uh, the writers of Lost, I mean Lost. Hey! Hey! Jane Espenson, <laughs> Vladimir Smetko, they're they're all here. Uh, and it's you know it's challenging every week because you're balancing two worlds and you're trying to thematically link them and you're trying to move the story forward uh, as mo interesting as you can. It takes us back to the casting process, which I guess must have been about exactly a year ago. Who was the first cast and what which which role went down to the wire? <laughs> Oh, uh, that's a long time that was ago. A year ago. I, you know, <laughs> just, what, what's ama what was amazing about the whole casting process for us was that, you know, all all these people you see on the stage are the characters as far as we're concerned, and they, and they just kind of were from the get go, and it's it's you know, is uh, is they elevate the material, everyone on this stage, and they bring it to life, and you know, we were very lucky in that usually when you send your script out, you know you get lots of passes or whatever. And we were fortunate that everyone we went to said yes. Mm -hmm. And so everyone on the stage was our first choice. And to be able to bring the show to life with the people that you wrote the parts for has been a fantastic dream for us. Yeah, I mean. I want to talk about one of perhaps the arguably the most vivid characterizations going on in the show, uh, Rumpelstiltskin, played by Robert. <laughs> Robert, what's in your mind when you put that character together? What, what is he an amalgam of? Um, he's actually based on uh, three distinct things. And the first thing for me was um, I did a lot of work with masks back when I was in drama school many, many years ago. So when you put on a mask, things kind of change. So that was the first step. The second step was um, Italian Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte is very grand Italian farce. I've even doing it already, and it doesn't. <laughs> so what, once, I'd, once I had that in my mind, I thought, well, I know how he looks and how he moves, and then I needed to find some kind of voice um, because I couldn't imagine this, this voice wasn't really going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, it was, it was my son. It's my six-year-old son, uh, Pierre. So I just suddenly heard him because he, he run, walks about the house doing this kind of wee. <laughs> 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 that's him. That's him. So I uh, once I put all these three things together. <coughs> and for the and for, for the rest of you, what's it like to do a scene with Rumpelstiltskin? Is it is it unsettling? Is a it a little creepy? Is it, do you get giggle fits? It's only difficult because we all love Bobby so much yeah. that I ha I know I have to remind myself right before we start rolling that I'm afraid of this man. <laughs> Because it's kind of a hard, no offense, but it's kind of hard to be afraid of you. Yeah. Yeah. As you're you. lovely and wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Those it. are fighting words. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to get some uh, clarification on a little bit of the Once Upon a Time rule book from the producers. So for example, as Henry has told us many a time, nobody can leave or bad things will happen. So is every car that ever goes down that road, is it gonna skid off the road or? <laughs> well, unless they're giving birth. <laughs> There's always that. Okay. The auto uh, shot's really you know, busy. I would say, for clarity's sake, it's people who have been cursed to be in this town. And, uh, and I think that what that rule means and how it affects everyone is something that uh, we'll see a little bit more of as we go down. This I, can, I can see you facing instances like, for example, Giancarlo Esposito, who plays Sydney in the Magic Mirror. He uh, just booked a pilot. So if that goes to series, you got to get Sydney out of town somehow. <laughs> Or we have to do a lot of scheduling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think you'll see uh, Sydney has a, uh, an arc this season. So, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of our actors uh, sometimes will do other, other um, roles on other shows, and it's, it's scheduling. It doesn't, just because somebody's doing a pilot or on another series. You know, in Lost, Nestor was doing a show, um, and he came back and told Jack his destiny whenever we needed him to. So, you know, we had the same. <laughs> 
Sonia Wilder was doing serious. Yeah, interviews. so it's we're, we're, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it happens, so it's really more of a scheduling nightmare than anything. And as far as uh, time had stopped in Storybook until Emma showed up, yes. and yet Henry did obviously age because Regina spoke about, you know, being handed yeah. him as a baby. Uh, is part of the curse that nobody has picked up on the fact that? Yeah, and that it's, things changed when Emma arrived, and that only since she arrived and time started moving forward have people started to kind of realize things were going on and the whole kind of curse world that had been created had been altered. <coughs> and the last topic, I know it's, you, you don't like people getting ahead of themselves. We just started the show and all, but the curse and undoing the curse. Mm -hmm. There's obviously some sort of formula yeah. that will undo it. Are you going to start dropping little pieces of, pieces of that in season one? Well, perhaps we already have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Vlog about that tonight, people. <laughs> or see that on the night. boards. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me we're not moving story forward. <laughs> We'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, remind us where Emma is at as far as believing little Henry. Uh, zero. Zero. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, it's been fun to be able to play her from the perspective of how anyone would actually react. It's literally like someone coming up to you right now and saying, oh, by the way, this is Snow White, and this is Prince Charming, and you're like, yeah, sure it is, OK. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm, because he is a kid, and because I know he's had a, troubled, a little bit of a troubled life, I can attribute it to him needing to deal with his problems that way and, and sort of embrace it that way. But, um, you know, there hasn't been anything that could really legitimately prove to Emma that this completely insane idea could ever be possible. But do you think there's going to be like one aha moment where she's like, holy Disney friendly expletive, the kid's right? <laughs> Or is it going to be you more of a gradual? You should see the expletives in our scripts. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> they are not Disney friendly. Too. Um, uh, our scripts are not G-rated. No. no. No, they're not. They come up with amazing variations mm -hmm. on those expletives as well. Um, <laughs> I really wish we could really talk about it, but we can't. No, we can't. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I mean, I, listen. I'm, I, that's that's the up to them, you know. Um, I think that um, you know, there's enough that she's going through at this point, um, and the episodes that are coming up after this, that um, she's going to start to think something's up. I don't think she's going to think, oh, there's a magical fairy tale land where fairy tale characters are actually real. But I think she's starting to realize that there is something off and there is something wrong, but she's not sure what. Okay. Okay. Now, Emma had the kiss with Graham mm -hmm. before. <clears throat> R.I.P. That whole thing. Uh, and as they kissed, he had this. He had his epiphany. He realized yeah. he was the huntsman. Maybe I should just run around kissing everyone. Well, <laughs> that's where I'm going with this because Mary kissed David, right. and you know it was a nice kiss and all, but it was definitely not sideways Sawyer and Juliet touching hands. Why, Thank why, you. Was, why was that? Um, I guess we're gonna have to work on that. Yeah. Um, I, I actually had the same question. Mm -hmm. And. As did you. Mm. And we went running to them, and then they explained to us what breaks the curse, which I am so not going to tell yeah, anybody. Yeah, we can't really tell you. But once they told me, I kind of felt like a dum-dum, because <laughs> well, it I, makes perfect sense. Well, what, what I will say is if you, if, you, if you go back to the pilot, our, our good friend Rumpel talks about a savior who's going to be born, and who's going to come on her 28th birthday, and the final battle will begin. And Unfortunately for these two, they're not that savior. They just so, had to make one. Yeah, so they made the savior. They made the savior. Their job's done. Welcome. They can kiss all they want. <laughs> yeah. They can kiss but all it's not No done. pressure. So, so it is going to be a matter of Emma opening a kissing booth. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. I am single, That's you next know. Miner's Day Festival will be a kissing booth with Emma. <laughs> <laughs> if the finale is entitled Kissing Booth, then... <laughs> Lana, my first question for you isn't so much a question, it's just a simple, hot damn, your wardrobe is the evil queen. <laughs> do, do slipping into those outfits get you halfway there to planner? I'd say about 60%, yeah, yeah, for sure. The minute I put on those, I mean, I can't breathe when I'm wearing them, but um, it really does help me uh, create the character. It helped from the very beginning. And they just continue to get more elaborate. <laughs> and big, bigger, and bigger. I'm like, I don't remember my ass being this big. And now, 
okay. <laughs> Bigger <laughs> everywhere. Now, a lot of fun. Obviously, she's a lot of fun to play. As an actress, what do you do to make Regina as rich a character to play, <clears throat> as a, it's enjoyable? Because um. <laughs> she's got to walk that fine line of, yes, she's evil, but she can't be a total witch to little Henry. No, no, no. I, I, from the beginning, I've always been very conscious of uh, her love for Henry. And um, that's been extremely helpful. And the threat with Emma, um, the hatred for Mary Margaret, <laughs> and the fun and playfulness with Mr. Gold. <laughs> um, so I, I, Regina, she's, she's a great character. The queen is just, I mean so bold and big and you can fly. I feel like I'm flying when I'm playing her. Well, I like, I like in the earlier flashbacks before she got you know, officially evil, because she's got on the lighter colors and she's a little bit more demure and you're just like, who are you kidding? Yeah. You know. <laughs> we solicited some questions from the Paley Fest website and one of the people wanted to know if we we're ever gonna get some insight on how things were between Regina and Henry before he decided that she was the evil queen. That's a question for Eddie and Adam. Well, I think we got some insight in, um, you know, Archie gave us a little bit of insight in that they were clearly having problems um, and that she's strict. And the more she kind of loves him, the more he kind of pulled away. But, you know, what that relationship is and what it, what it could be is something that is kind of explored a little bit more this season. Okay. Uh, segwaying from evil to charming. <laughs> Josh Dallas, first of all, just give the ladies that smile that they seem to like. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about what uh, is this whole thing with Catherine? Is that going to be a big, long-lasting obstacle for David and Mary going forward? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. It, it certainly it's put David in a place where he is um, feels very guilty and very responsible for. Uh, her disappearance, and it's yeah, it's it's a, it's an obstacle uh, in the way of uh, of Mary and, and David, uh, but you know their love and their unexplainable attraction that is so strong will always keep drawing them together in some some sort of capacity. However, I am told that the Catherine thing will last for a couple episodes, but then it'll be basically you know, somewhat resolved, and then there's going to be another obstacle. Can you tease it all what the next obstacle is going to be? I don't know. I think that's another question for the boys. I think <laughs> I, I, the, the yeah, they, they said you might be afraid to answer. answer. We're so afraid to lose our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't give anything away. I mean, we get fired. Yeah. So. I mean, the nature <laughs> of the curse is, is that no one can have their happy endings. So there's, huh? yeah, the, the saga continues. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, is, was it intimidating at all to be cast as Snow White? I mean, did you have any grade school experiences? Uh, Snow White was my favorite, actually, of, of all of the fairy tales. And I actually really was Snow White a couple years ago for Halloween and uh, very I adult. was also in Wonderland the same year, by the way, which is just totally weird. <laughs> no kidding. God. And I actually, and, and this is such a side note, but I actually said to my, my little sister and I were planning our Halloween costumes, and I said, you know, my biggest dream is to be a Disney princess. And I said, and I feel like if I'm ever cast as a Disney princess, then I can never dress up as one for Halloween because that'd be so pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be, so I'm really glad I got that part out of my system. But, um, you know, the thing about the script was that, I mean, though they were presenting us with these iconic characters, you know, they presented us with the things that were happening off page, and they were fleshing out these characters, and they were showing us their flaws. And so there wasn't really, I can't say there was any intimidation because it's not that we were aiming to replicate the performances of others or, um, you know, we weren't trying to bring the Disney animated feature to life or something. I feel that we justify all of those stories. You know, you can say like, oh, I can see how Disney's Snow White is kind of loosely based on the real Snow White, which we hope everyone feels this is the real Snow White. <laughs> uh, but, but that gets, you know, the fact that we, we did start revealing Princess Snow White's flaws in the pilot meant that I felt very free to be creative. And you must love that she's pretty badass too in, oh, the, yeah. in the flashbacks. Oh yeah, wielding a sword. I mean, I was on page what, like 10 and she pulls out the sword and I was like, I'll take it. I had said that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Rafael Sabarge, who plays uh, Dr. Archie Hopper. I understand you're going to have some interesting people on your couch in upcoming episodes. Tell us about one of them. Uh, I guess I, I've, I've been allowed to say. Um, I'm happy to be able to be given. Um, uh, we have uh, 
I mean, Archie obviously has been working mostly with Henry and trying to help him sort of uh, bridge the gap. Uh, we have uh, some new patients with um, Prince Charming, uh, as it were, <coughs> and, um, and then Mr. Gold. <laughs> no. <laughs> he has issues, like we all do. Yeah. Uh, Likes he, to work them out. He's got serious issues. I can imagine what that session's going to be like. <laughs> it's a double. It's then, a double. And then what, what brings uh, David to the doc? David's got problems. <laughs> you know, he's got, he's got a lot of things he needs to figure out. I mean, the guy was in a coma for 28 years, and he wakes up. He has no idea where he is or who any of these people are, and all of a sudden, hmm. there's a woman saying, I'm your wife, and... You used to love me, and uh, he's trying to, you know, figure that out. He's trying to figure out why he doesn't love her the way that he used to or, or uh, is supposed to, and, you know, dealing with uh, his feelings for Mary Margaret and, and, and why he loves, has this pull and this blinding love towards Mary Margaret that he doesn't have for Catherine, who he's supposed to. So, you know, he's got, he's got things to work through. Okay. From, from a therapeutic point of view, Archie's got some real job security, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rafael, you were telling me backstage that uh, we're going to be seeing Jiminy Cricket himself again, though. Yeah, Jiminy uh, will sort of factor more into some of the center of these stories, which is really fun. Um, and uh, uh, we know his backstory, but now it's sort of... Uh, his cricketness will will, will, will appear. We, we, we can see that Jiminy Cricket will be leading an intervention. We just won't tell you who it's for. Okay. Um, Robert, speaking of uh, Mr. Gold's issues, what do you think uh, most informed Rumpelstiltskin's particular disposition? Was it what happened with his son, or was it what happened with Belle? What do you mean, Mr. Gold's issues? <laughs> I say that because I'm sitting very far from <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, well, obviously, gold's a can of worms. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. But um, he, he goes to see um, Rafa because he, I think, basically, he doesn't have anyone else to talk to. There's no one else in the village at all that he can really <clears throat> speak to. So he goes to, to, to address some things to, to Archie. And at the end, of course, at the end of the scene, he does say to him, it's a lovely line actually, the guy who wrote, he said, uh, you, you've got some kind of, something that stops you from talking about this. And he says, yeah, there's a gag order. And Gold says, I like the image. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that in mind. So he can't possibly tell anything about this that he could be in serious danger. Robert, you, you and Lana had that great scene a couple weeks ago, you know, tell me your name. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are we going to be getting any more frank talk between the two of them now that they've both shown their cards? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> along the lines of... Give us a <laughs> um, Is there just going to be one such and such contest after too another? Much. Yeah, there is too so much. much. <laughs> I would say that they will be speaking out in the open from here on. And uh, what will be the question I would be asking is what are their agendas? Awesome segue. I was going to ask about the stranger's agenda. August, yes. this guy who just showed up in town. He's got an old school typewriter. He's yeah. tinkering with Henry's book, doing God knows what. Is, how, uh, what's the pace for unraveling what he's up to going to be? You know, b before we get to the finale, we'll be pretty clear on who he is, what he's doing, why he wants to do it, and how he's going about it. So that, that's going to be coming up soon. There's already a lot of theories bouncing around, but are you willing to at least rule out one theory that He's Henry growing up. Here's what I'll say. Wow. <laughs> it's, I don't, there that's it is. not bad. Wow, why did you guys think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we just rolled that out. <laughs> then, then Henry's Thanks. trying to hook up with his mom. in front of the cast. <laughs> uh, he's wow. Henry. Yeah, he's Henry from the future. <laughs> <laughs> Can we reshoot anything? <laughs> Well, here, uh, what I'll say is this, which is that, you know, th there are a lot of theories out there. Someone's got it right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, and then the whole matter of Henry's father, you, you've indicated that's something for the longer term. The, uh, we have indicated that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want, you want us to give everything away? Oh, I know. Yeah. No, no. We're just here to talk. We're just here to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk about burning questions. <clears throat> Jennifer, what... Did Snow White do to make the Evil Queen so mad? 
we address that this season. Yes, we do. Um, and, and I think is it, is it worthy? It really is, and I think that um, its complication is what's so beautiful about it. It's not, it's not black and white, and I think that it really adds a richness to the relationship between Snow and the Queen that, um, that we will need in subsequent seasons, so I'm delighted that we share that with you right now. It's, up, it's coming soon-ish. Yeah. Like a month. Mm -hmm. Eddie and Adam, one of the now. great things you guys have done is you, you create this patchwork of backstories for all the fairy tale land characters. And, but you jump in time. You'll jump forward, and then you'll re rewind and go back. What's an example of the next little missing piece that you're going to fill in for someone's backstory? Well, I feel like we left Snow White uh, at the dwarves' hovel, and she drank a potion, and she has no idea who Prince Charming is. And so we've got to pick that up because, you know, as uh, Rumpelstiltskin has reminded us, all magic comes with a price. So to drink a potion and uh, forget somebody you love has a price. Rumpy loves that line, there's always a price. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next little piece after that is exactly uh, what we're just talking about, which is why these two don't like each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Steve Perlman, I know you used to run the ship, so to speak, at V on ABC. And uh, you, you all had the green stage up there in Vancouver for V. And this cast is working with a, a very similar green stage. Can you describe for the people exactly what a green stage is versus just a green screen? Uh, it, it's a giant sound stage, probably about as big as this room that is surrounded on three sides in um, green curtains. And it has a green floor, and when you go home at night after working in there for a full day, you actually see orange because it's the <laughs> color opposite of green, so you can close your eyes and go to bed and see orange. Um, <laughs> But it, it's what allows us to do a lot of the things we do. I mean, the, the sequence that you saw in the episode this afternoon um, where um, Grumpy and Astrid uh, were in the grinding room and the, the bag of fairy dust went up into that contraption, that was a about eight wooden columns standing in the middle of a big green screen stage and everything else that you saw in there was all a uh, virtual set. And so that, that's one of the more complex sets that we've done. Um, and it, it just allows us to do things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And for the actors who've done a lot of the green stage work, do you have any anecdotes from doing it? Like, well, for, I mean, for me, it was extremely disorienting at first because I had never done anything like that on a green screen. but. Um, I found that I quickly had to learn how to revert back to like my childhood imagination. Like I had to go, I have to like create these walls and, and really create the walls because there's nothing to hold on to. We have a very, uh, well, not maybe like a couch. It's like if you want to talk about the Queen's Palace, there's just that <coughs> love chair and a table with a candelabra and that's, like her, that's it that's all that's there so you really really have to use your imagination and you, go, you do feel slightly I never see orange when I go home <laughs> but um, you, you need a lot of air <laughs> it gets it gets really uh, claustrophobic in there after a while you even though you're in this fishbowl but do you get like directions from the director saying oh no, you can't walk that way because you would have just oh yeah the everything's fireplace. taped off you walk through walls <laughs> very easily yeah. Yeah. But, then, but then also the it's, a, it's amazing because there's someone standing over the monitor over in the corner and they actually have the image superimposed like you just walk over off the, the frame the <laughs> so you can sort of walk over and go oh wow that's what it is yeah so it, it it's the, the visual effect team is just incredible, and, and what they do, uh, uh, it takes eight or nine days to do this. Eight or nine days to turn this quality out, it's just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The producers, do, do you feel like you've, you got your startup costs on that front as far as the CGI? You feel that you got a lot of that out of the way in season one, and so if there's a season two, and let's face it, there will be. <laughs> um, uh, only if people keep watching, yeah. yeah. Will season two, will that money be, you know, like about polishing the rough edges on that stuff and oh, kind of yeah. kicking it up a notch? I think everything is about, you know, everyone on this show and every department just has this incredible attitude of just trying to keep making things better and topping themselves with everything they do. So we hope to, if we get to keep going, to keep kind of raising the bar on what we do. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes our ambition outweighs our technology, but we're not going to lower our ambition and we're going to keep improving the technology. I want to talk about some casting stuff. Uh, Lana, you've got Barbara Hershey coming on as the evil queen's mother. Yes. <laughs> That's such a treat. 
We're that, so happy to have her. Is it happy to see me between them, though? I'm sorry? Is it happy to see me for them, though? Do they get along? <laughs> um, ish. Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. Um, I did say to her, can we just have one Beaches moment? <laughs> just one. <laughs> like, and so we managed to pull that one off. <laughs> like one moment where she's my best friend. And then it's over. <laughs> she's, uh, she, yeah, we're, we're, we're lucky to have her. She's a blast. And is Pinocchio, is Pinocchio currently in Storybook? Is he a, a mailbox or something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> also oh, God. Oh, my God. Uh, he, he is the, uh, the Storybook mirror dispenser in front of Granny's. <laughs> okay. That's a sad little fate. <laughs> And uh, there was a couple weeks ago, there was an allusion to the Little Mermaid. Uh -huh. uh, the Queen made mention to her that that's a road you'll probably want to go down at some point. Is, is part of the obstacle there, like the whole water thing? I know you did an underwater scene a couple um, weeks ago. Honestly, it was, it was, we would love to tell the story of Little Mermaid and Ariel. And for us, it was more of a season two thing. We just have a lot of story with the people on the stage that needs to be told first. And, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, toys in the toy box we just haven't got to yet. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to bring Ariel on. There are a bunch of princesses that uh, my daughter constantly mentioned that I think. <coughs> Could I turn into Ursula at some point? Just one. <laughs> I would love that. That's a good idea. Is that a good Should idea? I not be in the Ariel episode? <laughs> <laughs> No. You Ariel said you love the tank. Swimming with me. <laughs> Doesn't all have to be in water. All right. That's true. That's true. You know, it's matter uh, from water. It's always raining anyway. <laughs> this is true. Oh yeah. How has Vancouver been treating you weather-wise? It's cold and wet. <laughs> but you know, Vancouver Thank looks beautiful, and you know uh, the crew up there are so diehard. You know, this crew stands in the middle of the forest at 4 a.m. and gets snowed on and rained on, and, and they're you know, always in good mood. there's a growling yeah, wolf. They're literally, I thought Jamie was going to be eaten by that wolf in episode seven. I did too. You're talking about hundreds of people who are seeing orange. No. Yeah. <laughs> they're making this show. So, and Vancouver looks beautiful, and yes, it rains, and it's, it's difficult circumstances, but it's beautiful, and I, I think we can Well, and also, up. every time we shoot a scene that we think we are definitely going to have to reshoot because it's... 100 mile an hour winds and it's raining sideways and my hair's like going in my face and it's and we're shivering in the scene. It ends up being gorgeous. Like yeah. it ends up being oh, no. like the best looking. In, in the pilot, the castle scene that uh, uh, <coughs> Emma and Henry had. There was a uh, tsunami. It was a oh, tsunami. I mean, it her was. hair was it like really was. this. Looked like the Memorex thing. And they were and blow drying my hair with two blow dryers between every take. Like, Henry blew away twice. Yeah, and we literally <laughs> were like. <laughs> This, this, is, this is a waste, and it turned out to be one of the best scenes we ever did. Yeah. Or how about how we had a real snowstorm during the casket scene, the opening? Oh, that was right. And that was, we, really we, it really started dumping snow, and the, the lid of the casket was CGI. <coughs> so I, they had a problem with my flinching <laughs> when I was supposed oh, to we, be on contract. We, we originally had glass in there, and then it fogged up because it was so cold, so we took it out to put it in later, and then the snow was coming in and pelting it. And, and by the way, <laughs> Jen, Jenny was in a, uh, that little gown, and it was snowing, and, and I remember walking out, and we were going to put her in an actual tree trunk, and I did not know her very well at the point, and I thought, <laughs> oh, God, this is where she's going to turn to me and star out. <laughs> this is where she's going to be like, do you know who I am? <laughs> and I looked at her, and her face had this weird, and I, I remember looking at you going, are you okay? And you go, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we're in. <laughs> It's all worth it. Mm. All worth it. I just thank God it. I'm always in leather. It keeps me warm. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, always in leather. Yeah, I oh, out. a lot of other people. It's an unbelievable <laughs> process to get dressed for shooting outside. We have all these sticky hot things. They, they, they like they're like what, what are, are those, those called? They're hot shots. <laughs> hot shots. Hot shots. But there's ones that you can stick to yourself. So, literally, it takes me a while. Like, ready? There's ones that you put in your boots and then I stick them to my toes, and then I put my long johns on, and then I put two silks on, and then on the top silk, I put them all the way around. All over, all over. And then I put one here, and I put one here, and I put one here. And on your back. And they're all on my, yeah. And then I had to put my mic pack on, and then I have to wire that, and then I, then I put them under here in my arm. <laughs> and then we walk like we're a bottom of the snowman. So if you ever think we gain weight, it's padding. <laughs> It's just all the hot shots that we have. And you like literally look like the Unabomber when you take your clothes off. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, you know, hey, it keeps you warm. <laughs> well, Jennifer, they, they teased us with uh, Sheriff Graham earlier this season, mm. you know, gave us a, a few episodes with him, then yanked him away from you. They yanked him away from Mayor Regina, who probably enjoyed having the boy toy and everything. <laughs> Yeah, any, any need a replacement. <clears throat> any... <laughs> Getting lonely in Storybrooke. <laughs> well, I think I, that's what I liked about the character, about having him with Regina, was it showed that she's got base needs just like anybody else. Sure, sure does. <laughs> I, would say, I would say that Regina has a lot of base needs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any plans to have Jamie Dorn back? We have some Dorn volunteers. We love <laughs> well, uh, you know, Jamie may have had his heart ripped out in Storybrooke, but he is still very much alive when we go back to Fairytale Land. So who knows? I'd keep watching. Yeah. Our next section is fashion. I got some reader questions here. Uh, Eliza <laughs> wants to know, Jennifer, are we ever going to see Emma in a dress again? Maybe at a Storybrooke ball. <clears throat> Um, well, Again? Uh, Do you wear a lot you of jeans. dress at all? In Just the pilot. When I, pilot. In the pilot, pilot when I was dressing oh, as right, someone yeah. else. Oh, that was sexy. She's going to have a leather jacket <laughs> dress. Um, a leather dress. Yeah, maybe a leather dress. Be like her dad. Be like her dad. Aww. Make a red leather dress. Yeah. And then a blue leather dress. Yeah. And then a brown leather dress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a white. Throw in a black one every once in a while. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, we, uh, she's, she's not a big dress girl, but I feel like, you know, that this season uh, is, it, it, there's so much hitting her right now in terms of her starting to feel emotions that she's never felt before because she's been so closed off her whole life. And, um, you know, so much changes for her so quickly. Now having Henry back in her life and, and having a friend for the first time in her life and having to deal with having, feeling vulnerable basically <laughs> for the first time. And um, I think, you know, hopefully, as you said, if we get a second season and things continue, I think that you will see how she dresses and how she carries herself change as she starts to open up more. I think that that will always, her emotional journey will be reflected in some ways through what she's wearing. Okay. And Jennifer, I've got Lauren wondering, do you like Mary Margaret's style? I do. I really do. Um, we... I feel like we walk this fine line of trying to bring in something timeless, and we used Jean Seberg at a point as an inspiration, but we also have to keep her from having a sense of, a real sense of style, because that would imply a real sense of self, and that's something that separates Mary Margaret from Snow White. I still do have a lot of fun with, with those costume pieces, for sure. And Robert, you're not getting out of this particular topic. I've got uh, Cyprith wondering, what is the name of the nail polish color? <laughs> That Rumpelstiltskin wears. <laughs> On personal. Uh, I don't know. It's the, 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 <coughs> the nails come pre-made. They, they come in pre-made. And I think they're the kind of uh, greeny black kind of color. A little bit of gold. Limey. What, what, what I believe it's called Rumpel Broken Soul. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, how, how long is that whole process? The hair, the teeth, the um, skin, the The whole glitter? thing, uh, the, the, the makeup itself takes just under two hours to do. And then um, it takes an hour to get off at night, which is a, a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the strangest thing of all for, for people is that, you know, the, the, the boots that he wears, the leggings thing? 20 minutes. 20 minutes wow. just to lace that up. He started peeling his skin off during rehearsal once and throwing it at me. It was really upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to sell it on eBay. So it's one of those things where you're like, I know it's fake, I know it's fake, but that's really gross. Like it was... <laughs> now our last question for this portion of the panel, I've got uh, Cordy wondering if there's, wants to put out the question, if there's any other character you could play on the show, who would you want to play? Mm. So let's start with you since you basically play a, a, a mere mortal. Um, Who would you like to play on the show? That's a really, I would probably say Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> Josh approves. <laughs> Why, because he's got swagger? Or? Well, I, you know, I want to like go fight things and swing swords yeah. and ride horses and you know, that's... You guys are that. Twinkies today. We are yeah. kind of Twinkies, aren't we? Yeah. I like it. Uh, Jack, Jack of the Beanstalk, I think I would really like to play. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's not on the show. I know. Oh, you mean on the show now? <laughs> <laughs> maybe oh, no, I, maybe I heard you know something else. I thought you meant to like the character we had yet. On the show now. Uh, Rumpel, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I would just get to come to work looking like me. <laughs> Raphael, what about you? Uh, the Evil Queen. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Definitely. We All right, should do an episode that way. <laughs> yeah. well, should... What about a musical oh, episode? Can we... anybody sing? We all sing. They all oh. sing uh, beautifully. Josh just, comes uh, singing stage. Yeah. Yeah. Song Josh is a can lot sing. Of work. Rumor has it. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Season three. Yeah. Right, we're going to take some audience questions now. So what we're going to do is, if you have a question, raise your hand and wait for someone Whoa. with a microphone to come to oh. you. Oh. And I ask that when you uh, get the microphone and you ask your question to stand up, please, so they can get, uh, so we can see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, start with oh, someone right there, the the lady in, <clears throat> down here, the lady in the blue uh, jacket. I love it. Stand up. Hi. Stand up. Oh, oh, sorry. For everyone in the cast, when you first got called out to come out and do the auditions, and they told you what the concept was. Um, what was your idea of, of, I get to play some person in, a, in a, a small town, and I also get to play some storybook character, <coughs> although except for you, who you basically get to play one person, which yeah. is kind of a, much easier for you to keep track of your storyline. But That's yeah, super easy. Yeah, during the audition period, what were, you, what were you guys thinking of the concept and whether or not you could get behind it? This question isn't for me, so I can't answer it. <laughs> so, some of the, uh, uh, I don't know. Juggling dual roles is the topic. Yeah. Is it, is it uh, a little tricky there? How do you guys like playing two different characters? Well, I think it's a pleasure. It's yeah. a pleasure, and it's rare that you get to do that, particularly in television. And, uh, you know, the, the, the guys wrote a, a script, the pilot script that came around. There was just nothing like it that I read that pilot season or any other pilot season. And uh, it was just such a, a gift to think that you could come in and be able to play uh, two different characters who are essentially, I mean, for, for me, for Charming and David, they're, they're essentially the same person, but uh, they just have different experiences which make them different. Uh, and that's, that's a joy, and, and I love playing both of them you know, for that reason, for the reasons that they are different. And Jennifer, it's probably the same for you because, you know, as we said, Snow is kind of hardcore and Mary's, a little, you know, much more reserved. Yeah, Mary is the, the <coughs> version of um, what could have gone wrong had Snow White been repressed her entire life. Um, you know, Mary is the one who puts obstacles in her own way, whereas um, I feel that Snow takes responsibility for everything. And uh, so her, her obstacles are all external and... And it is, it's a wonderful challenge. I don't think we'll ever have an opportunity like this again. Okay, let's take another audience question. Uh, you? Whoever you've got there, right there. Is this based on more of the Disney content or the uh, comic book fables? I mean, it's, uh, well, I it's, it's definitely, <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's, it's based on this, as we said, this is an idea we've had for a long time and it's based on our sort of own take on these stories and how uh, you know, we've decided not to retell any of them, but kind of try to tell them in a new way that is kind of very specific to our own points of view. How about right down here in the front row? Our gal sweater. Uh, to touch on that, you guys do such an amazing job of uh, taking a, the classic story and making it new, and interacting with the stories that are going on in the show, and bringing characters from different stories. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the way you bring that together? Uh, well, for us, we, we were never interested in just retelling them. Um, you know, we wanted to, you know, why is Grumpy Grumpy? Why does the Evil Queen hate Snow White so much? We um, consciously decided to open the pilot post the happy ending so that we immediately let the audience know that we're actually taking place after the story that you know. Yeah, we wanted to, when we first started talking about writing the script, the idea of taking the, the one of the, what we saw as one of the most iconic endings in all of fairy tales, um, Snow White and Prince Charming, and then starting with that and then going right past it to kind of send the message, this show is not going to be about the stories you've seen, it's <coughs> going to be about where they could go. And then what we've had a ton of fun doing is finding the ways to mash them all up together and to take characters like, you know, as you saw, Little Red Riding Hood and Snow White have a relationship that we had never seen before and we thought was a lot of fun to explore and things like that. Another question? Uh, down here in the front row? Her? 
with the bracelet or uh, her. Okay, that works. Whatever. <laughs> right there. <coughs> um, I was asking more kind of a clarification um, with the way that the time started once uh, Emma arrived. Did that mean that pretty much no one was aging, no one was growing? Mm -hmm. And if that was the case, what about Henry? When did Regina actually adopt him if uh, Emma gave him up as a baby and now he's 10 years old? Uh, n no one was aging or, or growing at all in the town for the 28 years of the curse, except for Henry who was adopted as a baby and grew up in kind of this curse-hazed curse place. <coughs> and what happened was, is when he got the book, is when he started to notice that the children that he's been with are the same and everyone stays the same. And it kind of woke him up in a, in a way. Um, whereas, you know, when you're four, everyone looks the same age. When you're five, they look the same age. But now that he's older and he got this book, he's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to steal a credit card, track down my real mom, and have her come back and break the curse. <laughs> Which I think is a thought we've all had at one time in our life. <laughs> Definitely stealing the credit card. <laughs> Over on this side. Right down here, second row. So do any of you in your real life, like walking down the street, start seeing fairy tale characters at like Starbucks? You're like, oh, Pinocchio, <laughs> or like seeing parallels in your real life? I'm oh. seeing them now. <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent question, sweetie. You are Katie. all fairy tale characters, <laughs> and you don't know it. <laughs> That's right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I think that this show has really changed how I kind of view life on a daily basis, to be honest. Um, it, it highlights the idea of hope and faith in a way that we don't think about every day. And because I now think about it every day, because it's my job to, um, I think that uh, I'm, I don't walk around necessarily seeing fairy tale characters, but I do walk around sort of seeing small moments in life very differently and, and considering the choices that I make differently and considering uh, my relationships in my life differently. And um, I think that that really speaks to what Eddie and Adam do as writers and what our entire writing staff does, um, that there are these beautiful psychological underpinnings and, and um, political underpinnings and all sorts of things that are going on that are not at the surface but are speaking to us without realizing it and we're living it as actors every day and I feel like it's definitely affected my outlook on life. No, yeah. The, the episode they just showed with Grumpy. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the, the guys were saying, we've always taken for granted why Grumpy was Grumpy. Yeah. Who knew that he had so much going on in that head of his? Yeah. <laughs> so then, you know, when you go to Starbucks and like your barista's in a bad mood, you think, wait, why is this, you know, he maybe loves somebody, he had a really she can't love him rough and, day. And he just came out of life. an egg. He just got hatched out of an egg. Yeah, and he lied about selling a bunch of candles <laughs> and then, you know. <laughs> there you go. The, the egg hatching, that's a liberty you took? Yes. Yes. It doesn't was... contradict anything you've ever heard about where the dwarves came from. <laughs> well, I mean, the first question you had to ask yourself was, why, how come I haven't seen a female dwarf? And then, well, then how were they born? Well, then, of course, it was an egg. Of course. And, 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 and that's kind of... But great logic. First. Logical. Yeah. The dwarf of the egg. And, we think they came simultaneously. Because when, when that scene first came on, I thought maybe some of Steve's leftover footage from V had somehow, you know, found it. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we had to use the sets we were given, so. <laughs> Question over here? Let's go back. Right there. Hand right behind you. To your left. Bingo. Hello. First of all, I'd like to say thanks very much to the most talented, gorgeous ensemble cast I've ever seen. Wow. Right? And I do have a question for you, but first of all, I'd like to tell Josh a very personal thank you for moving my beautiful, almost 12-year-old granddaughter on from Justin Bieber. Thank you so much. Josh Dallas is the tonic for Bieber. 
I think now is the time to sing. Now is the time to sing. Thank you. Sing. Now, very much. And if, sing, Josh. And if I don't get your autograph for her, Josh, I'm on the next plane back to England. Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. I'll see you Thank after. Thank you, love. And my question is, after this brilliant season that we're all loving so much, what on earth are you going to do for us in the second season that's going to thrill us more than this? <laughs> <laughs> Taxi? Check, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I was told we couldn't ask about season two. Uh, I would add. say that we have some ideas in season two, and I think that the question you just asked is what made us passionate about the show, is we want to keep surprising people, and we want to keep them saying, what happens next, I don't understand. And if we can continue to do that, <laughs> uh, no. But the idea is to always push the show forward in unique and fun ways, and not just get settled into to what you know. Yeah, whether we succeed or fail, like our goal has always been to try to make this as hard for ourselves as possible. <laughs> and I think we're succeeding at that. Let's, see. Let's go on this side. Uh, raise your hand if you got a question. Uh, down here, third girl in. Oh, evil regal shirts. Wow. Can we see the shirts? Yeah. Can we see the shirts? Look at that. Look at that. I know. It says on the back, you have no idea what we're capable of. Yes! <laughs> they, 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 they actually sent me one. I have my very own. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, just thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you guys for creating this amazing show I speak on behalf of my friend and I. Um, just many questions, but one is, I love the little, the quick relationship we got to see between the Queen and Maleficent. Mm. Are there any plans to bring <coughs> her back, or is she going to be coming back in Storybrooke oh. for as a potential another fren frenemy for Regina? Um, you know, I, I think it would be disappointing if we never saw her again. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Adam, that was that was yeah. sneaky. I like that. <laughs> and awesome T-shirts. <laughs> 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 Let's go back to this side. Any questions towards the back? Right, go there. Yep. Hey guys, um, I was recently in New Zealand where I'm from and uh, the, your show just aired there, the first season, and a lot of New Zealanders are like, eh. And then I actually watched the pilot again. Thank you. And I was like, hell yeah, you guys better watch this shit. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> I That's never used to watch any TV shows, and my wife convinced me to watch your pilot. And honestly, I'm driving home on Victory, and I'm just like, got to get home, got to get home. Once upon a time, it's going to be on. <laughs> Do you guys enjoy watching it as much as everyone here does? Like, or is it more just acting and just providing the entertainment for everyone? I would say, I mean, I feel like, I can't, I can't speak for everyone, but... Um, I do look forward to seeing the show in, in a way that I don't normally, because I don't love watching stuff that I'm in too quickly usually, but because I don't exist in fairy tale land, I get to enjoy all of that as an audience member um, and really experience it as an audience member. And, um, and I always feel like there are things that, even in reading the script over and over again and actually doing the show, things come together differently when you see it visually. And so I feel like I kind of look forward to the puzzle pieces fitting together each week as well and, and on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. I have Sunday night rituals. Like uh, me and my loved ones, we make dinner and then we take it upstairs to the bedroom and we eat on the bed <laughs> and we watch the episode. Like I'm a fan, I'm a fan of the show. <laughs> Let's go back to this side. Um, just find somebody. Surprise me. <laughs> there you go. I want to know what your favorite scenes have been. Mm. I always like Bandit Snow. Yeah. Those are my favorite. I mean, to act in. <laughs> Watching wise, I'm always really enthralled with the Rumpelstiltskin story. Mm. Um, gosh, I don't know. There's so many. I always feel like. There's so many scenes that I love. And There's then it, so many. It's kind of like, uh, you know, every episode has something new. I would say I definitely would, um, I would lean toward probably that last scene with uh, Sheriff Graham. Mm. Um, I mean, not only was I kissing one of the hottest men on the planet, <laughs> which, you know, was okay. <laughs> um, 
but, uh, but it was really um, such a huge turning point for Emma as, as a person, you know. It was an incredibly vulnerable place that she went. I mean, she really allowed herself to love someone romantically, and even though it was for a brief moment, for the first time in her life. And, um, you know, normally that happens when you're about 13, and for Emma, it didn't happen until she was 28 and, and under crazy circumstances. So um, I think that that turning point for her was something that was really fun to figure out as an actor and experience. And then there was the kissing. <laughs> Lana, how do you, Lana, how do you begin to choose? That's a tough one. I just looked at Bobby and went, oh, well, <laughs> where do we begin? Because really? there's so many, and it's, so, it's different working with everyone. Um, working with the kids, and Steve, you mentioned this to me when I did the <coughs> Gretel episode. He said, it's so nice to see you working with kids. Like, it's the queen, because they just bring a different side out in you. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. But... I, I don't have favorites, really. I, um, I enjoy every, every scene. Some, I, I rode well, a I, horse recently, and that was fun. You did what? I rode a horse, and I had so much fun on that horse. <laughs> I did it. it my, well, my mom. I think almost everyone's been on a rider. horse at this point. Except for me. Except for you. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on horses. I really, really, really want to ride a horse. Yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy's, Jimmy's taking two horse back cars. <laughs> you, you have two cars, <laughs> and you got to kiss Graham. Yeah, you were on James you got to Jordan. Kiss Graham. You have a bug. You have the VW bug, which is awesome. That thing needs to be manhandled. That thing's like. <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question. We'll go down this row. Go back and to your right. Find someone over there. <laughs> <clears throat> Last question of the day. Okay, so this is inspired by the um, episode we just saw. What do you say to people who are big dreamers, like dreamers of like love or career-wise? Do you say like, you know, slowly go into it or just jump in the deep end? I, I say go grab it, you know? I mean, look, eight years ago, Adam and I had an idea and we said we want to, uh, our first pilot, to have everything you're not supposed to put into one thing. And we both came out, we met in college, and we said we wanted to be writers. And everyone told us, you will never make it, and there's no way, and it's really hard, and we did it. And you know what? If you don't have dreams, then what's the point? Yeah, so right. go get them. Well, I want, to thank, I want to personally thank all of you for coming here today and being part of this. It was a fantastic time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.